Hey guys, it's Amanda and welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to be talking about white culture. What was that you said? White culture? That's a thing? I know what you're thinking. White culture is an oxymoron. Whiteness connotates blandness and culture connotates flavor. I find it interesting that black culture is like a legitimate concept with tangible imagery that arises when you think of it, but white culture doesn't seem like a real thing in that way, or if it is, it's just like casserole. <laughs> anyway, whiteness as a whole can't be defined, but it's still so pervasive. Like when I think about West Coast culture, I think of white people. When I think about Midwest culture, I think of white people. When I think of Southern culture, I think of racism and white people. White culture is everywhere and nowhere because it's the default. But today I want to talk about, analyze, if you will, the pinnacle of white culture, crazy rich white people, old money. Old money is defined as the inherited wealth of the established upper class families, i.e. gentry or patriot, or a person, family, or lineage possessing inherited wealth. The term typically describes a social class of the rich. <laughs> The term typically describes a social class of the rich who have been able to maintain their wealth over multiple generations, often referring to perceived members of the de facto aristocracy in societies that historically lack an officially established aristocratic class, such as the United States. In the past few years, old money has gained popularity as an aesthetic, sort of in tandem with trends like dark academia. Tennis skirts, blazers, sweater vests, loafers, thinness, and whiteness are the bread and butter of this look. I think, I mean, I hope that everyone watching this knows the origins of most old money is problematic. These fortunes were usually accrued with the help of imperialism, slavery, and underpaid laborers who worked in terrible conditions. So I obviously want to acknowledge that, but today I'm not going to talk about how old money accumulated, rather how it went from relic of the gilded age to romanticized TikTok trend of today. So if we're going to analyze old money, we must ask, when did old money become old? In the United States, kind of recently. I read this book called Privilege by Seamus Khan that has a very comprehensive overview of the emergence of the American elite, so I'm going to be paraphrasing the first chapter titled The New Elite. Unlike European countries, America never had kings or queens. It defied notions of aristocracy from its inception and embraced the idea that every straight, white, landowning man was equal and could determine his own destiny through what he earned and not what he inherited. This idea became pervasive during the Gilded Age. After the Industrial Revolution, economic opportunity reached a newfound high. Previously penniless boys like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie accumulated unprecedented amounts of capital and became some of the richest men in history, all through the hard work of their workers who they attempted to distance themselves from. Gilded Age elites built literal and figurative moats to protect themselves and their wealth from the masses. Their culture was inherently informed by isolation and exclusion. These were the original gatekeepers, gaslighters, girl bosses. In the late 1800s, American elites built their lives inside barriers. Wealthy New Yorkers moved from factory and immigrant-ridden Lower Manhattan to create their own opulent oasis next to Central Park, now known as the Upper East Side. They founded cultural institutions like the Met to exclude lower classes from art that was commonly consumed. Opera, once popular amongst recent migrants, became reserved for those who could afford to watch it in a theater. A theater. Cultural differences became class distinctions, and one of the most notable divergences came through education in the form of boarding school. Seamus Khan writes, Boarding schools helped families construct and solidify ties with one another and ensure their children were well equipped to participate in activities with other elites. They were protectionist institutions aimed at providing not only the knowledge required to be successful, but the culture, morality, and social ties that were essential to the American elite. Over time, however, these educational institutions have shifted the direction of their moral compasses. Slowly but surely, they strove to be not just playpens for the wealthy, but a microcosm of the real world. As society became increasingly open for people who were not men and not white, ascriptive differences still mattered, but less than before. What was thought to be important was not what you looked like or where you came from, but who you were as a person. Were you responsible, honest, loyal, and hardworking? Khan writes, 
In no small part, the increasing emphasis on one's own attributes and abilities is due to a change in how the richest Americans in elite schools acquire their money. In 1929, the vast majority of the incomes of the richest 0.01% of Americans came from capital. 70% of what they earned came from their ownership of things like factories, while only 10% came from employment. By 1998, this had shifted radically. Today, only 17% of the income of the richest Americans comes from capital, and more than half of their income, 52%, comes from their employment. It is enormously important that today, the rich explain their position by the work they do, not the capital they have or the inheritance of their position. Not to mention, this also enables them to justify their massive salaries. It's gotten to the point where some rich people genuinely believe that coming from money is a disadvantage. You know what I think is a better advantage than f being born into something? Being born into nothing. I'm on the record. Remember I said it. Can't wait to watch it in 20 years. The internet the way it is today, I'd rather have zero than 100 million. People that have zero are like, this f guy's an idiot. That's because you don't talk to trust fund babies. I do. I talk to trust fund babies. They DM me. I meet them in real life because of my business career. They're f***ing sad. Do you, know what it, do you know what it's like to talk to a human being that looks at you at 22 years old and says, no matter what I do, no matter what I do for the next 80 years, it will never be my own accomplishment. Or despite their widely known financial privilege, they still try to convince other people and themselves that they came from humble beginnings and had to work their way to the top like everyone else. I never growing up had anything designer. You know, my mom wouldn't let me. I think I got my first pair of Louboutins when I graduated high school. Of course, having money has never actually been uncool or a legitimate disadvantage. It's always kind of funny when people say ex-celebrity has rich parents or they come from money and it's seen as undermining their talent or work ethic. It's like, no, this is just public knowledge. Sorry that it ruined the mystique of their origin story for you. While many celebrities try to downplay the role of their privileged origins and emphasize the importance of their hard work, it's rare to see the inverse, which is why I want to talk about Vampire Weekend. While they weren't actually super wealthy, they adopted a classic old money adjacent aesthetic that made it look like they were. Prep. Vampire Weekend was formed in 2006 while all the band members were students at Columbia University. This fact became such an integral part of the press they received because it's an Ivy League college, and from the start, Ezra Koenig, the lead singer, set out to make a preppy band. Not because it was a culture he grew up in, but because he was kind of fascinated by it. In a 2013 interview, he said, One thing I didn't realize was that, for me, preppiness was fun and weird. A bit of a costume, something that I liked on an aesthetic level, but half-hated. But all that stuff was always built into the music. The self-critique, the insider-outsider stuff, was always part of the music. But there were those who willfully misunderstood it. We set ourselves up so well to be a type of villain for uncharitable listeners. The fact that the band met at a prestigious university and sang songs about Cape Cod while wearing Lacoste polos sent a certain message about who they might be. Privileged, pretentious, and waspy. It didn't take much research to realize that this wasn't exactly the case. Ezra was open about the fact that he came from a middle-class Jewish family and got through college with the help of scholarships and loans and pointed out that his bandmate, Rostam Batmanglinji, was the child of Iranian immigrants. The whole point of Vampire Weekend was to toe the line between pastiche of prep and earnest investment in it. However, several critics only saw them as the latter and resented them for it. Nitsa Abibi took note of this in a 2010 blog post titled The Rules of the Game, a fuller thought on Jay Hopper and Vampire Weekend. Abibi began the blog post in response to a somewhat scathing review of Vampire Weekend's sophomore album, Contra, written by journalist Jessica Hopper. He explained his essay was less about defending Vampire Weekend and tearing down the reviewer, and more about dissecting the culture of criticism at the time. Criticism that was beholden to a kind of blind posturing that wants to stop it from saying anything useful or true. He dubbed this posturing the game. The game, he wrote, is largely played by people who are white and or middle class, and much of it involves trying to outmaneuver one another about precisely that fact. At the heart of the game is the fear and loathing and boredom concerning the possibility of being bourgeois. Being bourgeois is the game's great sin, and it is often referred to using the code word white. 
If you can't avoid the sin by virtue of being working class or Ghanaian or something, your best bet is to deftly corner the market on wary whiteness-based critiques of anything that smacks of being bourgeois. The critique will try to present itself as an incisive dismantling of class slash race slash privilege, but at its heart it will just be oh no, it's bourgeois. The great paradox here, of course, is that the game is itself an incredibly bourgeois pastime. From its inception, Vampire Weekend became an easy target for people who liked to play the game. They were written off as waspy and white, which weren't just objective descriptors, especially because they were objectively untrue. They meant something though, especially coming from other middle-class white people. In the game, being bourgeois is how you lose. So an indie rock band's unabashed performance of privilege was oddly infuriating. And while it was Koenig's instinct to defend himself, soon enough he realized it wasn't worth it because then he'd be just another player in the game too. In a 2013 interview, he said, when white college educated middle-class critics would hate on me specifically, my gut reaction was to say, wait a minute, you don't know. My dad grew up in the projects, and yes, I went to Columbia University, but I had to take out loans to do it, and graduated with a lot of debt. But then, the more I thought about it, it was like, who the fuck am I kidding? I'd be making myself equally ridiculous to play up my own background. Bella Hadid, please take note, it's usually never worth it to play the game, especially if you actually grew up rich. I never growing up had anything designer. I kind of wondered what the response to Vampire Weekend would be if they were actually very wealthy wasps, but I've come to the conclusion that it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference because they were treated like they actually were even after acknowledging that their blue blood was in fact a farce. This is coincidentally reminiscent of the story of Ralph Lauren, whose clothing brand and rags to riches story was emblematic of the American dream. Before founding his eponymous clothing brand, Ralph changed his last name from Lifshitz to Lauren. He didn't ever explicitly say he changed it to sound less Jewish and more waspy, but he was always teased for his name, so that's why he changed it and it ended up sounding very waspy. In a 2019 profile on Ezra Koenig, Graham Campbell writes, Ralph Lauren, like Koenig's family, came from the working class Bronx Jewish community, yet has become symbolic of waspy prep. Perhaps this is the reason for the resurgence of the old money aesthetic. If you dress like it, if you act like it, if you tell people you are it, you can and will become it. Although this does apply to nouveau riche aesthetics as much as it does to old money. Rebecca Jennings of Vox believes that this is exactly what the revival of this aesthetic is in response to. In an article detailing the return of prep, she writes, It seems to be arriving right on time and as a counterweight and companion to loud whimsical design associated with Gen Z and the name brand heavy California rich look the Kardashians made inescapable. People naturally go tired of too much of anything, and I think one reason that the old money aesthetic is kind of becoming popular again is that it's like slightly less materialistic than the California rich look, or it at least appears to be less materialistic. A huge part of any fashion trend is conspicuous consumption, the purchase of goods or services for the specific purpose of displaying one's wealth. However, the old money aesthetic emphasizes mannerisms, how one carries herself, the type of books she reads, languages she knows, and references she understands. And while these measures of social and cultural capital were, and still are, used to exclude, in our increasingly open society, some view it as a chance to improve position rather than as a barrier, but I do think you have to be privileged enough to see it that way. This may seem wildly contradictory, but the California rich aesthetic kind of reminds me of the old European elites where it's like you're either born into it or you're not. You either have that super expensive handbag or Lamborghini or you don't. A huge part of the old money aesthetic is education, albeit very expensive ivy covered education, but it complements our current meritocratic ideals. In the Vox article, Jennings notes, Anne Acquiring argued in the LA Review of Books earlier this year that an aesthetic like dark academia 
Dee exceptionalizes elite scholastic environments as much as it romanticizes them, arguing against the cynical view that the visual subculture glamorizes photos of books and libraries rather than the actual books themselves, or that yearning for the old money lifestyle only serves to revere the upper classes. I think this is a really interesting point because it taps into this desire people have to learn for the sake of learning, not just for school or for the aesthetic appeal. Over the pandemic, I think a lot of people have gained a sense of class consciousness, awareness of one's place in a system of social classes, especially as it relates to the class struggle, and have had the realization that this endless toil of having to work to live, sometimes having to work bullshit jobs to live, is incredibly bleak. At least among people I know, there's this desire to not make everything you do a means to an end. People want to exist without the pressure to make money or constantly be productive. This is exactly what the beneficiaries of old money got to do since most of their incomes came from capital, what they owned, and not employment, what they did every day. Of course, the origins of old money are problematic, but for many, Old moneyed elites are the only reference point for what it looks like to exist comfortably without spending most of our time working, so I feel like it's natural that people are gravitating towards this aesthetic. Or maybe we just simply like the look of loafers and plaid and blazers and I'm reading way too deeply into it. Who knows? But I do know that I hope there's a future in which people can live fulfilling lives, not centered around work, and not built on the backs of a subjugated class's labor, and still look cute while doing it. <laughs> okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts below, and I will see you guys in my next one. Bye!